Some guest with us today. Very honored to be here uh, with our ranking members on the committees that uh, are dealing with the health care legislation. Representative Pallone of New Jersey, Representative Neal, ranking Pallone, ranking member on Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Neal, ranking member on Ways and Means Committee, Representative Scott, ranking member Education and Workforce Committee, and Mr. Yarmouth, uh, ranking member. Uh, ranking member on the Budget Committee. All of these committees had a role in shaping the Affordable Care Act. All of these committees and our members, Democratic members, have a role in protecting our care. So I'm honored that they're here. We, of course, all were struck by the news uh, this morning uh, uh, and last night about Senator McCain and sent him our prayers. I'm a big believer in the power of prayer, so I have great confidence. Over the years, one of the things I always remember him saying to all of us under any circumstances was, keep on fighting. And I know that's what he will do, to keep on fighting. I was just sharing with my colleagues that uh, at 1030, I had a conversation with our colleague, Steve Scalise, uh, who sounds wonderful, and uh, just told him about our prayers for him our hopes for his recovery, uh, but not sooner than he really is recovered, not to come back any sooner. And, of course, uh, we try to comfort his wife, Jennifer, children, Harrison and Madison, but they really, their strength is a comfort to the rest of us so, in any event. Our, so here we are, six months to the day uh, when the president was inaugurated. Uh, we're here with no jobs bill, no infrastructure bill, no uh, tax reform legislation, no plan to avert the def default. It's just one of the most miserable six months, unproductive six months of any presidency uh, that I can think of. Instead, the Republicans have spent all of their time trying to raise America's health costs and reduce uh, the ability for uh, Americans to have the financial and health security uh, that we owe them. <coughs> we're here today as those who have uh, have fought for the Affordable Care Act, and we're very proud of the fact that more than 20 million people, uh, additional people, have access to affordable care and insurance, uh, the protections, no lifetime limits, children can be on their parents' po policy, no denying of coverage, uh, for pre-existing condition, no longer being a woman is a pre-existing condition. I think it's really important uh, to recognize all of the benefits of it. And since ACA, healthcare costs have grown at the slowest rate uh, on record. The life of the Medicare Trust Fund had been extended, has been extended by 12 years, and the Republicans want to do away with all of that. Trump Care, this new bill, they just introduced a new version this morning, which is repeal and replace. They've now walked away from repeal and delay. Uh, higher costs, pushing millions off their coverage, gutting key protections, crushing age tax, stealing from Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, really, uh, the bill they just had, and the headlines today are, 32 million people by 2026 would lose their coverage and premiums would double. So now, hopefully, supposedly today, we'll see a CBO report on their newest uh, uh, monstrosity. But I am hopeful. Uh, earlier this month, Senator McConnell said, if my side is unable to agree on an adequate replacement, then some kind of action with regard to the private health insurance market must occur. So again, that our door has always been open, our hand always extended to work with the Republicans in a bipartisan way uh, to improve and update the Affordable Care Act. Again, they have to set aside repeal 
uh, abandon cuts to Medicaid that are there and abandon their huge tax breaks for the wealthy that are in the bill. Uh, but we have to, uh, in their in the bill that um, one of the manifestations of their bill that they put forth, McC Senator McCain has provisions for cost sharing reduction payments, which is a positive thing, and uh, uh, possibly money could be used for reinsurance and other initiatives like outreach. So we, that is a place that we can come together to improve the Affordable Care Act that is already suggested in their legislation. Again, we have to work to reduce the cost of prescription drugs, expand tax credits for middle-class families, and ensure options for bare counties. And uh, over the past weeks, we have not been waiting for the failure of this bill. We have been working in our caucus, and members have made suggestions publicly and to our ranking members on how we should go forward. Today, we'll talk about a few of those things, and next week in our steering and policy committees, we'll have, uh, take testimony on, on all of that. So that is to say, the, uh, uh, we've got, we are pivoting. It's time for the Congress to pivot away from these uh, bills that are going nowhere, thank God, uh, but to complete, to, to make sure that happens. And as I conclude, I want to thank again the outside groups, the moms across America who've come here and, and spoken to members of Congress at here and in their districts, called in, told their stories, have made a tremendous difference. The people have spoken in terms of, uh, of this legislation. It's not good news for the Republican initiatives. Let's pivot to how we can get the job done for the American people. And with that, I'm pleased uh, to yield the floor to the distinguished ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Pallone. Thank you. I, you know, I, I just want to take a moment to thank our leader because she has handled this uh, situation with the ACA so well. Many of you remember when, really, if it wasn't for her, we would never have passed the ACA because she insisted that we had to do it. And uh, now, of course, she's been very vigilant in explaining to the American public why the repeal would be so devastating and now going the next step and saying, look, uh, if you stop this effort to repeal, uh, we are extending our hand because we want to work with you to strengthen it. So I just want to thank you for, thank you. for all that you've done. Um, in terms of where we are today, Basically, the message really is to the Trump administration and to the GOP, stop playing games with the ACA. Work with us. Uh, I think that the president continues to be very irresponsible. Uh, you know, the latest or yesterday saying, you know, just uh, repeal it and we'll delay it for two years. You know what the CBO said, what a disaster that would be. Up to 32 million people, an all-time high, would lose their insurance. But we're not taking that route. We're taking the route that we want to work with you and improve the ACA. I just want to mention um, uh, two things that I think are very important in that respect and would eliminate a big part of the uncertainty that exists right now with the insurance market. First, with regard to the, the cost-sharing reduction payments. Uh, the president announced yesterday that he's going to pay it uh, for another month. But that... <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, but that's ridiculous, right? I mean, the uncertainty in the insurance market of going from month to month, like, you know, paying month to month rent rather than having a lease for two years or more, is just ridiculous. And so the most important thing, I think, right now to eliminate this uncertainty in the insurance market is to uh, guarantee that those cost-sharing payments, which affect 7 million people, are paid, with, paid consistently and on time uh, long term. And just as an example, um, in, in my state, and I've mentioned this many times, the carrier Horizon, which is our biggest carrier, announced something like a 24% potential increase, only 8% of which was actually for health care. The rest was because of the uncertainty with the uh, cost-sharing reduction payments, the uncertainty about the mandate, all the things that President Trump and the GOP are doing uh, are basically resulting in this level of uncertainty that needs to stop if we're going to strengthen the ACA uh, and make sure that uh, insurance premiums don't go, go up exorbitantly and the carriers stay in the market because you know a lot of the carriers are actually losing, leaving the market because of the uncertainty. And the second thing is uh, reinsurance. Um, we 
uh, as you know, carrier insurance companies have to cover people regardless of their pre-existing condition. And there are a lot of people that are sick and it, it's expensive for them uh, to cover them. And so um, basically we had a program in the ACA called the Temporary Reinsurance Program that basically spread the cost of large insurance claims for very sick people across all the insurers. That needs to be made permanent. That was a temporary thing. It worked well as long as it was out there, but it needs to be made permanent. So that reinsurance program that we had in the ACA uh, would really make a difference in terms of carriers staying in the market and not having uncertainty in terms of how much their premiums are going to be. And I know that you know, some of the Republicans have said, well, that type of thing is a bailout. It is not a bailout. Uh, basically, we have, you know, hundreds of, you know, a lot of people costing these insurance companies a lot of money because the people are sick, because they need attention. And it costs a lot of money to cover their medical treatment. And I think we pretty much determined on a, on a consensus, bipartisan basis, that we want to take care of, you know, the sicker people. We want to make sure that they have insurance coverage. So why not do... Uh, uh, you know, what, what, why not make this a permanent program so that we can keep the carriers in the market and, again, create, uh, eliminate a lot of the uncertainty? I, I know Jimmy Kimmel said, I, I called it, it's, it's not me that made this up, the Jimmy Kimmel test, because he said, nobody should have to choose between rent or food or paying for a child's medical treatment. Nobody. I think that's very true. Um, and that's why we need to both uh, eliminate the uncertainty, both with the core sharing subsidies and also provide for uh, reinsurance. And uh, with that, I'm going to yield to uh, my uh, colleague, uh, ranking member on Ways and Means, Mr. Neal. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Thanks to the leader for keeping full attention uh, on the proposals that have come to compete with the Affordable Care Act. When the president uh, recently said, who knew that health insurance could be that complicated? I put my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's remarkable about it is we have now the plan of the day that's put in front of us. I don't know how CBO has time to do anything else but score plans on a daily basis. But the irony of it is you're talking about what is almost one-fifth of the American economy, the delivery of health care in America, and they have a new plan every day. So this is the fifth time around that CBO will be asked to score a plan, which already we know will still leave at least 23 million people without health insurance. And here's the, the noteworthy item. Consider this. Insurance is based upon risk assessment, trying to predict outcomes. So when the administration threatens to withhold subsidies, when the administration says that they are willing to violate the law by not enforcing the mandate, that contributes to the risk uncertainties so when the proposals, which would be nominal next year for increasing premiums, they now come in at anywhere between 5 and 25 percent, all because of the uncertainty that the White House is projecting with insurance markets. And what we're asking for is a period of calm, have the Republicans work with us to address some of these issues, particularly in the single market space, but to acknowledge that it could be done with some dexterity and simplicity, including more robust credits for those who find themselves shopping for insurance. That's the path to travel. And I, will, I look at this and I think to myself how hard it was for us after scores of months, hundreds of meetings and hearings to talk about the development of the ACA, and they have a plan every day that when put under the magnifying glass, still comes to the same conclusion. 23 million people will lose their health insurance. Insurance commissioners yesterday in Pennsylvania and Tennessee both said the same things. We need some certainty. Tell us what the subsidies are going to look like. Tell us you're going to enforce the mandate. And we will make adjustments based upon what you're telling us. Accurate information. And with that, I'd like to introduce Bobby Scott of Eden Workforce to give us his perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to, again, congratulate and thank uh, our leader for her reminding people that we're willing to work to improve the Affordable Care Act, but reminding them, too, that we're not interested in helping to make things worse. 
And we have to remind ourselves, as she did, of what the situation was before the Affordable Care Act passed, when millions of people were losing their insurance every day. Those with pre-existing conditions uh, usually could not get insurance, or if they did, they had to pay exorbitant fees. Uh, the people were hitting lifetime limits. Uh, those uh, families, half the families declaring bankruptcy, were in bankruptcy court because of, um, of um, medical bills. Uh, thanks to the ACA, 20 million more people have insurance today. The costs are going up at the lowest rate in 50 years. Those with pre-existing conditions can get easily get insurance at the standard rate. The no lifetime limits, bankruptcies are down 50 percent, on and on. But the Affordable Care Act did not cure all of the problems. It was a step in the right direction, and we need to make progress. But whatever anybody thinks of the Affordable Care Act, if you're going to make changes, you ought to improve the situation, not make them worse. And you look at all of the uh, solutions. After seven years of uh, voting to repeal the Affordable Care Act, <clears throat> the only thing that they've come up with are things that make things worse. Um, they're in a situation that involves arithmetic. You can't insure more people if your bill starts off with massive tax cuts and cuts in Medicaid. Um, the late, late, one of the latest proposals, um, repeal and replace later, uh, you know that's not going to work because if there had been a viable replacement, we would have seen it by now. And if, even if they had a, re, a, a, reliable, a, a, a credible replacement, you know they wouldn't pass the tax increases that would be needed to fund it. And so the idea that they're going to repeal now and replace later is obviously absurd. The more recent one uh, that was introduced this morning has the same problems. You're taking money off the table and trying to cover more people. Just this simple arithmetic uh, means you can't do that. But the incredible thing is even with the uh, repeal and replace later, the CBO scored that as 32 million fewer Americans would have insurance. Compared to present law, the premiums will double, and 75% of the American public would be in an area without uh, any insurance company in the marketplace. Now, the marketplace is um, extremely important because that's where you get your subsidies. Uh, that's where uh, you are protected from price increases, and the fact that you have a marketplace with many insurers uh, competition puts downward pressure on prices. If you have no insurance companies in the marketplace, then obviously uh, that's not a good thing. The incredible thing is that only a handful of senators came out against that plan. 32 million fewer insured, prices doubling, uh, few in the marketplace, and you only had a handful of senators opposing it. Why would anybody support a plan like that? We need to first defeat all of these plans and then get together and work together on the things that we know will improve the Affordable Care Act and afford insurance uh, for many more Americans at a lower price. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield to the distinguished gentleman from Kentucky, the ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Yama. Thank you very much, and I'd also like to uh, thank uh, all my colleagues, and especially Leader Pelosi, for their leadership on health care reform. Uh, we've been in it a long time now, and it uh, looks like the road is not uh, ending. One of the issues that has arisen in the uh, ACA era is the question of availability of insurance companies in certain areas of the country. Republicans like to say there are 1,300 counties in the country that only have one insurer, and uh, and now there are uh, approximately 40 counties that have no insurance company available. First of all, let me point out this is not a new problem. Uh, this was a problem that existed long before the ACA. I remember in Alabama, for instance, over 90 percent of the, the people in Alabama only had access to one insurance company. And the reason is there are a lot of people, a lot of counties in the United States that have very few people. These are predominantly rural counties. They are, tend to be lower income, older populations, and they don't represent a potential uh, lucrative market for insurance companies. If you only have 5,000 people in a county and a certain percentage of them will be on Medicare and Medicaid and, and in group insurance, there really aren't that many available customers to insurance companies. And that's the problem that we face in many areas of the country. That's not an ACA problem. That is a market problem. And there just aren't a lot of, there are a lot of uh, non-viable markets in the country. 
Now, we do have a problem in that because of largely because of the uncertainty that's been created by many of the moves made in Congress and at the administration level where insurance companies are dropping out of markets because of the uh, the uh, the possibility of substantial losses. We actually had a solution in the ACA. We had federally supported co-ops that were supposed to be able to provide competition and availability of insurance coverage to citizens wherever they may be. In my state we, of Kentucky, we had a very viable co-op. Unfortunately, the Republicans decided to defund the federal support for those co-ops. And my co-op and several others across the country uh, went out of business. Basically, my co-op was the most uh, had the most coverage uh, of any other insurance company in in Kentucky. It was a very viable operation. So there was a there was an approach to dealing with this these non-viable markets in the law, but the Republicans sabotaged it. So what's the answer? Um, I don't know many people in the insurance industry who will contend that the individual insurance market is viable without government involvement. As a matter of fact, the Republicans essentially admitted this in both the House bill and the Senate bill, because how did they deal with it? Cost sharing reductions, tax credits, high risk pools funded by the government. That's essentially a public option. And so they recognize that the individual market is not viable without government involvement. And here is where I think the government can provide a great service and what we will be looking into. And that's the question of a government organized or government run alternative to the co-ops essentially, a public option of sorts. It may be a new vehicle. It may be, as some states have actually proposed, allowing people to buy into Medicaid and Medicare on an individual basis, or it may be allowing them to shop in the federal employee's benefits plan. So there are options available to accommodate those people in markets where there isn't an availability of insurance companies, and we will actively pursue a solution through that, that means. Thank you. I thank my colleagues for their presentations and for their extraordinary leadership on all of this and the ideas that have been conveyed. Mr. Pallone talking about cost-sharing reinsurance, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Neal talking about tax credits and how we expand uh, access for, for millennials and others, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. And Scott talking about the threat that is there, 32 million people. I imagine. Imagine that they would propose such a thing while uh, cost dub premiums double, uh, according to the CBO. And Mr. Yarmouth uh, has been talking, working on this individual market, uh, insurance market issue for a long time and appreciate his suggestions there as well as uh, uh, those that have come from our colleagues. These, among others, we'll hear about them at our steering policy committee meetings next week. Any questions for my colleagues? On the subject of health, health insurance? No? Okay, well, we have a vote. So, uh, yes, ma'am, we have a vote, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Leader. Are you in any talks with um, Speaker Ryan uh, about this? What point negotiating? Um, what area? Well, I wrote a letter, uh, which you probably saw as a matter of public record, on July 18th. Uh, the American people have spoken. They rejected temp Trump Care's assault on the good health of Ameri on Americans, hardworking people. And and I do say, as Senator McConnell said, what I said earlier: if we can't do anything, then we're going to have to um, uh, address the cost sharing reduction payment issue. Uh, so I, I suggested that we get on with that, but we've had no conversations. The uh, all along, though, when we did the Affordable Care Act, contrary to this, we had. Uh, uh, hours and hours of hearings and uh, weeks. weeks of hearings and in a bipartisan way and accepted uh, scores of Republican amendments, uh, scores of Democratic amendments and modifications to Democratic and Republican amendments. So uh, we're, we're ready to work in a bipartisan uh, way on this. But so far, I haven't gotten a response to my letter. And some of my colleagues are writing to him, too, with some some other suggestions. But it's a pretty exciting time because this Affordable Care Act is something we feel very proud of, a pillar of economic and health security for the American people. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act. It took 100 years to pass, starting with Teddy Roosevelt, a, a Republican, well, then a, a bull moose. But in any of, uh, no, he wasn't. He was a Republican when he proposed it. And, and, uh, and then we go to a situation where... Um, that they would place this in doubt. 
But remember this, President Trump, President Trump wanted to repeal and delay. Trump care, 32 million people kicked off the rolls. Thank you. We have vote.